wages themselves again take many forms, a fact not recognizable in the ordinary economic treaties which exclusively interested in the material side of the question neglect every difference of form. An exposition of all these forms, however, belong to the special study of wage labor, not therefore to this work. Still, the two fundamental forms must be briefly worked out here. Wages take many forms, and while Marx acknowledges this, his focus throughout this chapter and the next are on the two most important forms, time wages and peace wages. This chapter will focus on time wages. The sale of labour power, as will be remembered, takes place for a definite period of time. Throughout the previous chapters, we've seen that labour power is sold for fixed periods of time. Time wages are the converted form in which the daily, weekly, monthly value of labour power presents itself. Thus, we have daily wages, weekly wages, monthly wages. It is clear that according to the length of the working day, that is, according to the amount of actual labour supplied every day, the same daily or weekly wage may represent very different prices of labour, i.e. very different sums of money for the same quantity of labour. The wage the worker receives is an amount of money they are given to represent their daily or weekly labour, or their wage estimated in value. However, this amount, the hourly price of labour, may represent different quantities of labour, depending on the length of the working day. If, for example, the daily value of labour power is £3, representing 6 hours of necessary labour time, and the working day is 12 hours long, then the hourly price of labour is £3 divided by the 12 hours, or 25p. However, if we imagine the working day is now lengthened to 15 hours, the price of labour would fall to £3 divided by 15, or 20p. The reverse is also true. If the day is shortened to, say, 10 hours, the price of labour is increased to £3 divided by 10, or 30p. In either case, however, the actual daily wage paid of £3 remains unchanged. So if wages remain at a constant, the price of labour will rise or fall depending on the length of the working day. On the other hand, it is possible that the daily or weekly wages may rise while the hourly price of labour stays the same, or even decreases. Let's imagine our labourer is working a 10-hour day, with the daily value of their labour power as £3 again, so an hourly price of £3 divided by 10 hours, or 30p. If now, for some reason, this price of labour remains the same, but the labourer worked for 12 hours, they'd have the daily wage of 30p times 12 hours, or £3.60. Likewise, a reduction of the price of labour to 20p, but an increase of hours to 18, would also see a daily wage of £3.60. What we see through all these examples, then, is that there are many methods of lowering the price of labour which are actually independent from any actual change in the daily or weekly wage. It loses all meaning as soon as the working day ceases to contain a definite number of hours. The connection between the paid and the unpaid labour is destroyed. The capitalist can now wring from the labour a certain quantity of surplus labour without allowing him the labour time necessary for his own substance. While Marx's comments on short time work are rather brief here, they serve as an example of how the worker becomes reliant on working for longer hours. If we again imagine our 12 hours workday with a daily wage of £3, giving the hourly price of labour as 25p. But now let's say that an individual worker is employed for less than 12 hours, for example, 8 hours they only receive a daily wage of 8 times 25p, or £2. In our example, we said that the workers need to work for 6 hours to obtain the value of their own labour power, but it becomes clear here that this individual worker cannot do this if they are employed for under 12 hours. Or to put it simply, they don't earn enough to live off of. By this severing from a 
fixed amount of working time into individual hours. It allows the capitalist to not only pick and choose the hours they want their laborers to work, eliminating the regularity of employment, but also to choose the amount of wages they spend, e.g. £2 now to our individual laborer instead of the fixed £3. Beyond this limit, the working time is overtime and is paid at a better hourly rate, although often in a proportion which is ridiculously small. Another brief point that Marx makes is that of overtime, which really, in essence, is just the lengthening of the working day, with many of the ramifications we discussed in chapter 10. But here Marx puts it in the context to the wage. His argument is essentially that increased working hours means that workers lose their energy or ability to labour at a faster rate than they normally would, and so the wage may be increased by the capitalist during these extra hours to reflect this. The point, however, is that, just the same as any other hours worked, the wage received is not an accurate representation of the value of the worker's labour power, and also may not reflect the worker's ability to sufficiently compensate for their decreasing performance. As a general law, it follows that, given the amount of daily or weekly labour, the daily or weekly wages depend on the price of labour, which itself varies either with the value of labour power or with the difference between its price and its value. Given, on the other hand, the price of labour, the daily or weekly wages depend on the quantity of the daily or weekly labour. Because the hourly wage is determined by the value of labour power divided by the hours in the length of the working day, we could say, for an example, that every hour the labourer works, 30 minutes are for the capitalist and only 30 minutes are for themselves. Under this relationship, our worker must now work through the whole day just to earn their three pounds or the value of their own substance, despite the fact that they produce that value in only half a day's work. We also see that for a certain price of labour, the daily or weekly wage depends on the amount or length of labour performed. So the lower the price of labour, the longer the working day must be for our worker to even earn their wage. What we observe here then is that a lower price of labour encourages capitalists to lengthen the working day, while at the same time, the lengthening of the working day lowers the price of labour.